Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Cheryl Reynolds and I'm with the UC Statewide IPM program. And welcome to today's UC expert talk on avocado diseases. Um, Peter Casina is here with me also from the UC IPM program and he will be helping with the polls and our technical issues. So now I just wanna introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is Dr. Ben Faber. He's the Soils, Water, and Subtropical Advisor for Ventura and Santa Barbara Counties. And today he'll be speaking on avocado diseases. So um, Ben, I'm gonna pass this over to you. Yeah, okay, so we're cool here. So um, we're gonna be talking about avocado root rot disease. And the, the uh, root rot disease is the scourge of the avocado world and literally i mean everywhere avocados are grown in the world this is a problem more or less um, the thing about avocados is that they originate in the most perfect world possible in these uh, cloud forests in central america on volcanic deep volcanic well-drained soils that have perfect water that comes from the sky every week of the year and just the right amount, not too much, not too little. It's not too hot, it's not too cold. And they're surrounded by plants that are um, happy to see them there. And you cannot imagine a better place for avocados to grow. Unfortunately, we brought these darn things into an environment that it's not the best of all possible worlds. And in the case of avocados, we have uh, quite a number of what we call minor diseases. And uh, we call these minor um, only when it happens to somebody else. I mean, if you've got some of these minor diseases like verticillium welt or botrysferia or something like that, they can be pretty shocking. Um, but there, there are ways of, of approaching them and resolving the problems. Then we have avocado root rot, and this avocado root rot is a is a it's a problem, um, and we can have considered it to be a primary pathogen. But what I hope to have shared with you by the end of this session is that it's a primary pathogen in the sense that it can kill. It can kill a tree, and it can be a shockingly fast or a very slow, prolonged, chronic death. Um, that it's very sad to see, but uh, it's entirely preventable and um, it can be turned around given the right attention. So let's go to the heart of what we call dis-ease or a disorder. And sometimes these problems are, are literally just problems. And um, for this issue to be associated with an avocado or, or any other plant that we call a disease plant, um, we have to have the susceptible host. And so in this case, we've got an avocado. Um, and then we have this pathogen, this avocado root rot pathogen, this thing that we can't see with the, the naked eye. And it turns out that there are various strains of avocado root rot. Some of them are much more virulent than others, but in general, um, if it finds a susceptible host, and you have the predisposing conditions. Now, this is the critical issue. What sets up a plant for disease? And um, then it can come down with that disease. Um, and the other critical factor, we, we, we've talked about the disease triangle, but really it's what's called a disease pyramid. It's, it's, a, it's uh, four-sided. It's a it takes time for a lot of things, these things to show up. And when they're in a chronic state, it sort of creeps up on you. You don't see it. You're occupied with other issues, bills, children. The law is after you. Something is going on that is so that you can't focus on and observe to see what's going on. A lot of diseases are slow and they are not noticeable until a year later. And I can't tell you how often I'll go out to see not just avocados, but citrus. And um, uh, somebody says, look what's just happened. And I'll go, no, no, this has happened, happened over a period of over a year. 
and something else is distracting you. Now, we also talk about the biotic factors that lead to disease or disorders and the abiotic. And so in the case of avocado root rot, you know, we are talking about kind of abiotic conditions that predispose the plant to disease, but we're also talking about the biotic, and in this case, it's the root rot pathogen. But it's important to really recognize what are the abiotic stresses that can lead to disease. And in the case of avocado, this poor thing is uh, notable for, my pointer is not going right, okay, is for alternate bearing. And you know, in, uh, this is where it has a big crop one year and nothing for the next year or maybe two years. A lot of times this is all set up because we have a cold spring and during the flowering period, it's just the tree attempts as hard as it can to flower and produce fruit, but the weather conditions are not right and you get skunked and there's no fruit. And then suddenly the next year, it's got all this pent up energy and it wants to fruit and you've got just the right weather conditions and bang, the poor tree is groaning with fruit and the limbs are breaking and boy, I guarantee you that's a stress for the tree. Um, we have these other, you know, kind of cataclysmic, uh, catastrophic problems like freezes, cold weather, or we can have these hot weather conditions. Um, you know, 110 degrees is not normal for coastal avocados, and it's not even normal for valley avocados, uh, central valley avocados, I mean. Um, so the trees are not adapted to extremes, and so that can predispose a, a tree for um, root rot. The most pro common problem in our area is salinity management or lack of management and water management or lack of water management. I'm saying this because we are in control of that poor tree's water and if we don't, we don't do it right, the tree is going to suffer. And water management for salinity, getting the right amount at the right time, the timing is, is important. You know, an avocado tree <laughs> in Santa Paula, California, in one year, one avocado tree is going to use uh, several thousands of gallons of water. Um, it's something on the order of a full-grown tree of about 100 gallons per week. So 52 weeks times 100 gallons, that's 5,200 gallons. So you could put that all on at once and you're gonna drown the poor tree or you can space it into three applications. So that's 1400 gallons per application or that's or whatever my math is. Or you can spread it out to hundred gallons per week and the tree likes that. Um, you know, we're really in the, in the face of not having any rain um, forecast, uh, that may be what we end up doing. Anyway, an avocado tree likes small amounts of water frequently because it does not have a substantial root system. It's basically looking at a root system that's 18 inches deep and you've got to keep that moisture in that root system, but you can't keep it too wet because that leads to root rot. Actually, any stress is going to lead to it. So if you stress the tree for lack of water or the frequency of water, it's going to stress it and lead to problems. Another problem, grafting, when you top work a tree from a variety like you know, bacon to Hass, you, you cut out a lot of the stored energy and that to regrow that canopy is taking energy and it's a stressful situation. Pruning, you know, we've allowed a lot of our trees to get too darn big and then we come in and we whack the dickens out of it and that then becomes a stress. So we, we can have these kind of chronic background levels of, of stress, these abiotic, you know, so-called lack of human or lack of um, biological input. But a lot of times this, these are, this is human related. How we water, how we prune, how we approach a tree can be considered biotic as well. Anyway, um, at this point, we're going to have a, some questions, I think. Correct, Peter? Uh, we have a 
poll question, two questions that are coming up that Peter's going to bring up. Okay, let's have them. And you might have to um, scroll down a little bit. There's two questions with this. And for the second question, there's several um, choices and you might have to scroll down to see all of them on your screen. So the first one is um, what conditions are needed for a disease to develop? And then the second one is what stresses will predispose the plant to disease? Hot diggity, where's rock and roll in there? Okay, so, uh, you know, th th this poll is pretty obvious. I mean, I'm, the whole point of this presentation is we are in control of disease in an avocado tree and with avocado root rot, and it's a bad, bad disease, but we can do a lot of things to, to um, prevent it and, and to actually treat it. So, so avocado root rot, it's uh, caused by Phytophthora cinnamomi, and these are the symptoms, thinning canopy, it's the most serious avocado disease in California worldwide. It's brought on by excess soil moisture, really poor drainage. And so if you could grow avocados on pure sand, you can get away with a lot of poor irrigation. Um, well, too much irrigation. Under irrigation, you can't get away with it. Um, you'll see small leaves wilting. You can see the sky through the tree. Now you can see those poor fruit out there. They're, they're exposed and those are all gonna sunburn. So you're not even gonna be able to harvest the fruit off a tree like this. Um, the point I'd like to make here is that the root rot looks exactly like no roots or no water. And it's, it's not getting water because it has no roots. So the avocado root rot is destroying the roots and it creates a condition where the tree is wilted. So what is the first thing a person does when they see a wilted tree? They put more water on it, right? And that's exactly the worst thing that you can do because the asphyxiation that is caused by, by adding extra water to a wilted tree like this is the condition that the uh, avocado uh, root rot organism loves. It loves to swim around in, in, in wet soil and those are the conditions that a root doesn't like. A root wants air, it wants to breathe, and every time irrigation is done, you exclude air. Irrigation is one of these necessary evils that we do to plants in California. They need water, um, but every time we water, we, we exclude air, and this predisposes the plant to, to root rot. Okay, progressively what happens is the canopy thins out as the roots disappear. So the canopy is coming into balance with, with the roots. As the roots disappear, there's less uh, root system to support the canopy and gradually we get this dying back, what we call staghorning. Um, you'll get small yellow leaves. I've seen leaves on avocado trees that are 18 inches long. Now these can be <laughs> biblical in size uh, because lack, because water is not taken up properly, tend to get a lot of salt burn damage, tip burn. So small yellow leaves with tip burn, wilted leaves, these are all symptoms of root rot. They're also symptoms of lack of water. And just because you see wilting does not mean that you've got root rot. Um, these are symptoms, and so there's a lot of things that cause symptoms. If you had a lot of uh, compaction, um, if you've got a lot of kids running around the base of a tree, if you've got a lot of equipment running across the base of trees, if you cause soil compaction and lack of air, that may simply be lack of air. It may not be root rot. So you want got to dig around and explore what is causing this problem. Okay, as you lose the canopy, that exposed fruit gets sunburned to the point where a lot of times it's not even harvestable. It's oftentimes very small too. And then here's another symptom. Um, you know, we've talked about the thinning canopy, the exposed fruit, the smaller leaves, the salt damaged leaves, but 
One of the symptoms of a root rot tree is it lacks energy to the point where it can't produce enough leaves to drop on the ground. So back here where we see a more healthy tree, you see the leaf mulch that it forms. The leaf mulch is critical to an avocado tree. It must have leaf mulch. It is part of its psyche. It needs it to survive. You've got a shallow root system and those roots get into that mulch and that's where they thrive. Um, when you lose the mulch, you start getting into a situation where it's, it's, it's a, has a, a feedback, it's got a loop where it loses the mulch, and it, then it goes into stress, it creates a situation where it's not producing leaves and, it, and it's not producing mulch, and then the wind comes along and blows it away and doesn't have enough energy to produce any more leaves to produce mulch. And one of the, the ways we have of interceding to stop this cycle is actually to put mulch down, a nice coarse woody mulch, similar to the coarse woody mulch that's not, excuse me, leafy mulch. Uh, avocado leaves don't like to decompose. I, I've done little studies where tagging leaves in a mulch um, naturally occurring and it can come back three years later and the leaf is still there. It's decomposed, but it's not, but it's still there. So when you get down on your knees and start looking at what's in this root system, you may find only these coarse roots, or you may find no roots at all. Okay, this is for sure a symptom of a lack of roots, and it easily could be a symptom of root rot. So when you start looking at all these symptoms of dying canopy, thinning canopy, small leaves, uh, tip burn leaves, no mulch, and then you d dig around and you find nothing but big roots or even no roots at all, boy, you'd better be pretty conclus conclusive that you've got uh, root rot in there. So this is how root rot starts. It starts feeding off the little roots and feeds back and, die and chews away to the point where you've got no roots at all. So. When, when you first start suspecting that you might have root rot and you go out and you dig around and this is what you find, you can start turning a plant around like this once you correct the problem that is causing it. And it's, it's basically water management in most situations. So in avocado root rot, you're losing the small feeder roots um, to the point where you cannot find them. Um, it, 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 if there's still a mulch in the in the orchard or under the tree and you start you know, pulling that back and you don't find roots there at the interface between the soil and the mulch, ooh, that's not good. And you start digging around in the, in the wetted area where the sprinkler is or the drippers are, ooh, if you can't find roots, if you only find big thick roots, ooh, that's a good sign that um, you've got something wrong with the root system. Um, Okay, you're losing these roots, so you can't take up water. And um, because you can't take up water, you've got a canopy that is not being satisfied. When you water that tree, and so it's, that canopy can't be satisfied, it's, so it wilts. And if you then keep watering it, you're going to cause it, this disease uh, collapse, this spiral down because it's, you've got root rot going on, you've got rot going on, and you add more water and it makes the situation even worse. So you get to the point where you, you may only find some pencil sized roots or no, no roots at all. So generally speaking, root rot is a chronic problem. It's something that you know, it starts, unless it's a young tree. I've seen young trees die within a year. Um, but if it's a mature tree, it's been fine for several years, 8, 10, 12, 15, 25, 30 years old. It looks good. There's a new ownership go on. Somebody didn't want to pay the bill, so they cut it off. Or we've had a, a, these catastrophic rains where we get five inches in 10 days that can set up the situation for root rot. And then you can actually see a pretty catastrophic collapse. It, it might, um, you can have dead trees within three months. Now that's not very common, but the last uh, really big raids we had in 98, we did see some 
uh, trees collapsing pretty rapidly. Avocado root rot can be spread pretty easily. Um, uh, it's spread, it's, it's carried by dirt, it's carried by water, it's carried in equipment, it's in, if you've got pickers out there that go from grove to grove, you're carrying it, they are carrying it, it's on your, on your tires. Um, if you've got an orchard that's, you know, much older than five or six years old, it's pretty good likelihood that it's got the pathogen present, so you've got the disease pyramid, you've got the avocado present, you've got the pathogen now present. Now you've got to create the conditions. You've got to create the, the right, you know, freeze or hot weather or heavy crop or pruning or grafting or water management or salinity management that sets those trees up to come down with disease. So we're going to have Cheryl ask our third question here. Okay, so you should be seeing the, the question in the poll come up um, to select four sim symptoms of avocado root rot. And um, while they're answering this, Ben, there's a couple questions from Kevin. Oh, please. Okay, so the first one is, um, would having a nearby grove uphill from you also be an abiotic environmental factor to, pre to predispose your grove? Okay, this, you know, may be, just be semantics. You've got, if something is above you, you know, where water can move down into your grove and carry uh, the, the pathogen, yeah, it's, it's going to be an abiotic source. It's going to be the source of, of the disease-causing organism. Um, again, if you've got an orchard that is much more than five years old and you've had any traffic going through, if you've got coyotes, um, if you've got neighborhood kids that have come over and played in the orchard from an orchard that was infected, it's quite likely there are no virgin avocado orchards in California that I, I well, I can tell you, I'm not going to tell you where they are, <laughs> but, but, you know, any of the orchards that we see, you know, along the roads and, you know, um, it's quite likely the, the, um, the pathogen is in your orchard. Next question. Okay, and so he also asks, what would be the consistency of the best mulch? All heavy wood chips or a mix of chips and leaves? Good question. Mulch, mulch. Of course, mulch is something that's applied to the surface. You never incorporate a mulch in an avocado orchard. It's always applied to the surface. That's the definition of a mulch, something applied to the surface. And you want it to mimic the coarse uh, aerated, natural leaf mulch of an avocado orchard. And so you want a coarse, woody, fairly large, you know, you don't want to have lumber out there, but you want to have one, two, three inch pieces of, of, of chips um, that decompose slowly. You know, you, you don't want to have, I mean, if you have grass clippings that you can put out there on a frequent basis that, um, you know, can be persistent, that the roots can adapt to, you know, that's probably all right, but very few people can do that. So you really want to have a relatively stable environment that, that comes with the coarse woody mulch that is going to be there for three or four years. And the whole idea is to put the mulch out there and kickstart the system so that the tree then starts producing its own natural mulch. It's, you know, um, I, I, mulch is good for avocados. And uh, if you put too much on, and I've seen people put three feet on, which is crazy, but you know, you put too much on, even a coarse stuff starts heating up and you start getting warm conditions and release of gases and so on. So, you know, you want to be reasonable, you know, three to four to five to six inches of, of mulch out there that you can economically spread. Does that answer your question? I think so. And actually, a few more have come in. Um when you were answering. So do you want to take these now? Sure, let's go. Okay, so Ben asks, other than top dressing with leaf-based mulch, do you recommend any work be done vertically within the soil profile? And then he says, for instance, gypsum, compost, mulch, mycorrhizae, or other things applied vertically down into the soil. You, you really want to mimic the natural process out there. You, it starts from the top and it works its way down with the worms and the bugs and the gophers and all that stuff. So 
you know, you don't want to be messing around with that root system. Trees don't like their roots messed with. So l l let nature take its course. Next. Okay. And, and then um, there's another question about what about the prunings? Do we chip them and leave them under the trees? Good. Nothing should leave an avocado orchard except for the fruit. And maybe not even that. But anyway, I hope you're making money. Um, so yeah, the pruning should be um, cut and chipped in place. Um, you don't want to have it stacked up against the tree. You want the stuff chipped in place. So I, I know it always takes, you know, a chipper is in one spot and you, and the prunings are two, three, four, five rows away. There's, there's some work involved. Um, but, you know, if you're imaginative, you'll figure out how to, how to do it. But really, it, you don't want to move anything out of the orchard. And um, then there's just one more from Catherine, and she asks, what is the fix? The fix is irrigation management. <laughs> it's mulch. It's gypsum. It's, uh, you know, uh, we have a chemical that works that's available to everyone. It's not organic, but it, it's an amazing material. And if you have a, the opportunity to start an orchard all over again, we have clonal rootstocks that are, that will die if they're not managed correctly, but you know, at a level of, of, of um, resistance to the disease. So onward. Okay, so that, that's all we have right now. So the, um, Peter's going to bring up the poll results. So if you want to go through the results there, Ben. Yeah, so actually multiple choice. They're all right. Thinning canopy, numerous small fruit, black roots, wilted leaves. You know, that's a distressed tree. And it's a, not a guarantee, again, that you have root rot, but those are all symptoms. And they're all symptoms of a distressed root system. So why is it distressed? Is it compaction? Is it, I, I, I looked over a fence the other day and somebody had trenched a neighbor's orchard or trenched the other side and they'd cut off half the root system. And that was the problem. <laughs> so it wasn't root rot, it was, you know, they'd lost half the root system and they didn't know it. So anything that, that compromises the root system will give you these symptoms of root rot and it's up to you to figure out what's causing those symptoms okay okay so now um peter closed out the poll so you can uh, go to your next slide thank you okay phytophthora cinnamomi is everywhere and here is an example of i'm not going to tell you where this is at um, but i'm sure it's it's on a road where everyone can see it here are trees that are perfectly healthy in the neighbor. You can see the fence line right there. These trees are dead. And so this grower right here is sticking around and paying attention to the tree. And this grower right here is in Las Vegas every weekend fooling around and not paying attention and the trees are dead. So it, it, the, the question, I, I think it was Kevin asked, okay, I've got, a neighbor or there are trees above me that have root rot and is that mean i'm gonna get well here is an example of below i mean obviously these trees up here have got the pathogen oh i'm telling you that they do and that water has moved down the slope and it's contaminated these trees and these trees die. well these trees have got the pathogen okay but the trees are being irrigated correctly and, I, and I'm emphasizing irrigation because that's the number one stressor that we have in this area, because that's the number one thing that we do. Okay, so Phytophthora cinnamomi is not a fungus. All fungi have chitin in their cell walls. These guys have got cellulose. They're what's called a brown algae. Okay, so this is why mulching works. This is why mulch is so important because mulch is made of cellulose the mulch is broken down by fungi that are feeding off of the cellulose and if there's phytophthora present with their cell wall made of cellulose they are going to be chewed up as well so you, by putting a mulch down you create an antagonist you create an antagonistic organism okay this is an uh 
a pathogen that has a stage where it's got a, what's called a zoospore. It's got a little flagella there that, that swims. It likes water. So these are called water molds. Okay. And it turns out the question was, what's one of the fixes? Well, gypsum using calcium sulfate is one of the fixes because it's a, it's a recognized material that reduces the ability of the zoospore to move around. Once you have Phytophthora, you have a spore, a chlamydospore that can live for more than five years, and I've heard as long as 25 years. So once Phytophthora is an orchard, it can persist for a very long time. You're not going to get rid of it. Okay, there is talk in the old days, I don't know how old some of you are, but 30, 40, 50 years ago, we talked about fumigation, and it just does not work against a chlamydospore. It's going to come back. Um, so the question number four comes up now. Cheryl, take it. Okay, so yes, so Peter's bringing that one up, and um, this one is how long can Topthorus cinnamoni persist in the soil? And we did have one other question that came in from Susan, and she wanted to know if you'll be telling the chemical name. Um, oh, yes, stick around, Susan. We'll get to the chemical name. Okay. okay, so this poll will just be up for a few more seconds. So the whole idea is that, you know, once, once our industry is contaminated with phytophthora, it's not going to go away. It's here. And we have to learn to deal with it. And remember the disease pyramid. You've got the, the, uh, the host, you've got the pathogen, and creating the conditions over a period of time is what creates the stress that sets the tree up for disease. Okay. All right, so the results are coming up. Yeah, I don't know about 100 years, but I, I wouldn't bet against it. Okay. okay, so I think we're gonna close out of that poll and then you can go to your next slide. Thank you. So there it is, there's the, the, the uh, mulch and there's the, the antagonistic fungi. That's not the Phytophthora. Remember, Phytophthora is not a um, fungus. It's a brown algae. You're not going to see it. It's going to be swimming around in there. But it's, um, this is the antagonistic fungus. It's breaking down the mulch. It's going to break down the cell walls. And this is how we deal with it. Okay, we spread a mulch out. We mound, okay, mounding and mulching are going to improve uh, the, the, the ability of the tree to persist. And we've got these big trees back here and these little trees right here. These trees are on a completely separate irrigation line than these ones here. Okay, that's critical because these trees are going to need water a lot. They're going to need, you know, several hundred gallons a week um, or once every two weeks. And these little puppies, they're going to need maybe twice a week, one gallon or two gallons or three gallons. And so if they're not getting the right amount, this is an orchard that has Phytophthora in it. You're putting a young tree in there. It's the most susceptible of all of them to, to, to the, the ravages of, of, of Phytophthora. And they'll collapse within a year. So the key here is irrigating them correctly. Now, I, I, I've seen lots of orchards where a tree has died and they go in and they, boom, they'll throw a young tree in and it's dead within a year because it's being irrigated the way the old trees are. So question number five. Okay, so Peter just put that one up. It should be in the middle of your screen. So why does mulch help against phytophthoras? Okay, I think Peter's gonna close out this poll and bring up the results screen. And there you go. Yeah, yeah, we got it, we got it. So the mulch is antagonistic because of the microbes feeding off the mulch also feed off the phytophthora. Thank you. We've gotten another idea across here. So on to the next. So we do have what are called clonal rootstocks. They're called clones because they've been vegetatively propagated from, from trees that have shown resistance. Um, if you're trying to buy something like this from uh, a retail nursery, you're not going to get it. You're going to seedling nursery, which is going to um, be much more susceptible to phytophthora. But 
commercially, we can buy various rootstocks, and you can see the the response to to um, these are the same orchard, and you can see how the Thomas does compared to the Toro Canyon or the Duke Seven. So we we have ways of dealing with phytophthora. Number one is irrigate correctly, irrigate correctly, irrigate correctly. That's number two and three. Salinity management is number four. Mulching, mounding, gypsum, um, rootstocks, and irrigation correctly. Uh, okay, so now we're going to move into some other stuff. So careful irrigation, interplanting is a challenge. You always want to, when you interplant, um. you Excuse me? Ben, sorry to interrupt you. Did you have a poll that you wanted to bring up at the end of that last slide? Oh, okay, fine. Yes, please. Okay, so that one should be showing, can clonal avocado rootstocks die from root rot? And um, we actually have a question too that came in. Okay, let's answer it. Um, from Nick, and it says, what about DUSA? You know, DUSA is a great rootstock. It's a uh, can be temperamental, um, but it, it's, it does show good resistance to, to Phytophthora. Um, it is a little more sensitive to um, irrigation management. So once they're established, they, they'll do quite well. But um, initially, if you have a heavier soil, if you're not on top of your irrigation, you can have some problems with it just because of it's kind of temperamental. But it's a good rootstock. Okay, so now Peter's um, bringing up the results of that poll. Yes, clonal rootstocks will die if they're not irrigated right. Thank you. So it's, this is just one part of the system of fighting root rot, okay? So uh, controlling uh, and managing irrigation is, is uh, the most important factor in, in managing root rot in this area. So the question was, what chemical? Okay, we've got a chemical that is, um, was initially registered as Aliet. It's a phosphorus acid that's been buffered. It's sold under various names as a chemical, as a phosphonate or a phosphite. Uh, I can't tell you, there's over 24 brand names out there that are registered as um, uh, Fungicide, it's not really a fungicide, it's a, what's called a fungistat, that's aside from the point. But, um, but it works, it does, it's not a fungus, it does not eradicate the fungus, it's a stimulant for the tree and it, it's like a geritol that really works, if you can remember what geritol is. It's preferably, it's a buffered material, it's, it was initially used as a, a an acid, um, a 060, which is a mean material it's you don't want to be playing around with it unless you actually know what you're doing it can severely damage people as well as trees you want to use one of the buffered materials a 0 28 25 or 26 um, they're buffered with potassium or calcium um, but they work it can be used as a foliar sprayed on uh, relatively new leaves it doesn't work onto an old leaf it can be applied as a soil drench um, it can be injected through the irrigation system. It can be injected, needle injected into the tree trunk, or it can be sprayed on the trunk. So all these ways work. Some work better than others. Going straight into the trunk is the most direct and most efficacious. Um, there's a lot of materials out there. Some of them are registered as, as fungicides, or rather as materials that control uh, Phytophthora, quite a number of them are registered actually as fertilizers, but they, they all work. One of the keys to using this is understanding this growth cycles that occur in the avocado. So we're focusing on the roots. And so typically we see a root flush after the flowering and spring leaf flush um, in through the summer. And this is the period that we're trying to hit. So this material should be applied um, when it is going to be actively moving into the root system. Okay, so it's not, you're not killing the fungus, you're stimulating the tree to fight off the, 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 um, the phytophthora. Um, it 
tends, as long as the soil is warm, you'll have root growth. So when we have a warm winter, actually you might apply it in, 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 in the winter time. But normally things slow down. Whenever you can see a white root, it, it has the potential to, to, to work. Usually during the winter time, the soils are cold during this, you know, December, January, February, even into March, April. You won't find a lot of white roots. Um, the roots are competing with the flowering and the and the leaf flush. So what you're trying to do is hit that root flush when you're when you're applying um, the phosphorus acid materials. And there's, so there's an optimum temperature. Um, generally speaking, if you're looking at the air temperatures, um, the Phytophthora cinnamomi likes kind of middling temperature. It doesn't like it too hot or too cold. What you're looking for, what is, what's the optimum growth for the avocado? What you're trying to do is apply material so that during the optimum growth period of the avocado. So you're, you're trying to feed into that so it can fight off the phytophthora. So we have done injections um, uh, of the materials. It can look kind of nasty. But this is the results, you know, after one year of phosphorus acid materials, um, you can see a flush of new growth where there is nothing before. There are some fungicides out there that are registered. Methanoxin, um, Ritamil Gold is out there. The problem with these is that, uh, and there's a new one, Arondis, that is going to be available commercially soon. It is available now on Citrus. Um, the problem with both of the, these are true fungicides, and we had uh, Ritamil previously, Metalaxyl, um, that has developed, Phytophthora has developed resistance to it. And this is the problem with the true fungicides. You, these um, evolve pretty rapidly and you can develop resistance to it. So far, there's been no clear demonstration of a field resistance to the Phosphonates, phosphites, phosphorus acid. They, they work pretty well. So the other control methods are mulching heavily using gypsum, um, planting on mounds so that you improve drainage. Now, if you're on a slope where you get good drainage already, you don't need to do it. I've seen people mounding on slopes and it's a nasty <laughs> engineering feat. And, you know, when you put mounds in, you, you make it harder to move around. Uh, so you don't want to build these mounds just for the fun of it. Uh, you've got to have a good reason. Um, and if you've got a loam or a heavier loam soil, a clay loam, boy, definitely you want to do mounding. You want to use one of the Phytophthora tolerant to rootstocks like Dusa or Toro Canyon, Duke 7. And uh, irrigate, irrigate to the needs of the tree. Now, question number seven, Peter. Okay. So Peter's brought this one up. Why is interplanting a problem in an avocado orchard? And um, while that's up, we do have a couple more questions for you. Let's ask. Okay, so Kevin's asking, are you saying fertigating with 0, 060 0 that hits the trunk will damage the bark of the trunk? He has not experienced that. Okay, let's back off. You don't want to have water hitting the trunk in it, with anything in it. Okay, the, the, one of the next diseases we'll discuss if we have time is Phytophthora citroph, um, citricla or Phytophthora mengii as it's called now. It's crown rot, which occurs when you have wet trunks. So, number one, that's setting up a tree for Phytophthora crown rot if you wet the trunks. If you put, uh, uh, you know, one to two quarts of 0, 060, 0, into the irrigation line, it's going to be diluted. It's going to be buffered by the bicarbonates in the water. So, you know, it's not going to be a problem. So if it hits the trunk, but again, you don't want to be hitting the trunk with any water. So, um, you know, <laughs> I, you know if, if that's how you apply it, do it, but move the, the spray pattern off the tree trunk. Any other questions? Okay. And then there's a yeah, there's a question from Ben. Says, is there a level of decline in an avocado at which you wouldn't recommend applying chemical treatments, which would be utilizing a compromised xylem? Yeah, so if you're a commercial grower, if you can see through the canopy, it's gonna take you a while to bring it back. So I would cut this thing down and, and move on and replant. 
And so again, it's, it, it, takes a while. it takes a while for the disease to show up. You want it to catch it before it gets to the point where the canopy is compromised to the point where you can see through the root, through the canopy. Um, and I, I would just, you know, it's not worth the energy to bring it back. Uh, it, it can be done. Um, you know, if, if you are right on top of it, boom, 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 every six weeks you're getting some on, you know, you, you, can, you can really move it along, but it's hard when you don't have any roots to take it up, you know? It's, you, you can start with some injections and it helps, but you know, if, if you've got 10 or 15 or 20 or 300 or 400 acres, you're not gonna be bathing one little tree or two or four or something like that. Um, it's, you've got other things to deal with. So uh, see through the canopy, time to get rid of it. Okay, and then I have a question from Susan. Um, back a couple of slides, she was asking what the different colors in the graph were showing. In the graph, um, I'm not sure what the graph was. <laughs> Does that um, it was kind of, I, it was probably back maybe five slides or so. Okay. It had a wavy, curvy graph. Oh, oh, okay, oh, that was the growth habit. Okay, so the brown was the root growth. Roots are brown, right? Okay, so it was trying to show that during the period of late spring, summer, fall is when you would apply one of the, the uh, phosphonate materials. So you, you, you want to hit that growth period. So the, the, the brown represented the, um, that growth, that period when, when we do see the root system growing. So, you know, this, uh, if you want to review this um, PowerPoint, it's going to be available online. So you can look at it at your leisure after this. Yeah, we'll have the recording. Um in a few days. And then there's one uh, final question at, right now. It's, um, does phosphite move in the root system when applied to one side? Phosphite is systemic. It's truly systemic. It moves throughout the tree. It, it, it's, it, um, it moves in the xylem and then it can, and moves into the leaves and then it can move down with the phloem into the root system. So it will move throughout the tree. There's kind of a, um, in, a, in an older tree, you do get some compartmentalizations, and that was, is one reason why you, you want to space out in, injections or, around a tree, because you'll, you'll get better dis, dis, um, movement throughout the tree, but it moves wherever the, the, um, the sap flows. So, um, I mean, that, that's, and that's why foliar applications work. You put it on the leaf and it moves down in the in the sap into the root system. So it'll move throughout. Okay, so Peter's put up the results of that poll. You should be seeing that on your screen. Uh, why isn't it planning a problem? Because you can't get the irrigation right. Really, it's, it's if you can't irrigate them separately, don't bother to replant. You'll just spend all your time replanting. Okay, on, word. Okay, so um, there are, I'll, so really, uh, we, we've covered avocado um, root rot, and, it, and irrigation is the major predisposer to, to that. Uh, the, Kevin asked the question about irrigating the, the, the um, 0, 060 0 into the irrigation system. This is what you get with um, a, a wet trunk. Um, and I'll tell you, Somus is the hot spot in the whole wide world for Phytophthora uh, mengii or Citricola. It's, it's, I don't know why it's there. Um, it's, it's not the same Phytophthora. It's a different species from Phytophthora cinnamomi, but it likes water. And if you keep the trunks wet, you'll see the cankers wherever it, the, the sprinklers hit, or you'll see it on the north side where it doesn't dry out from the fog. Um, so it's, it's a water-related disease. Are, at this point, are there any other questions about root rot at this point? Um, there are a couple questions, and um, we're also coming up at the, the end of our session. So okay. um, 
We'll yeah, leave so, that for later. So um, we'll, I'll ask you these last couple of questions, then we'll have to put up our link um, to our final survey pretty soon. Okay. But I want to make sure these questions get asked. Um, one is, have you looked at incorporating any microbial products at planting or throughout the year with irrigation? Yep. They don't work. Uh, I spent about five years doing this with different microbials and we did it with and without mulch, with and without uh, irrigation controls. And if you put mulch out, you got all kinds of wonderful things showing up. And if you didn't have the mulch, it didn't matter how much microbial put, you put out, Pseudomonas, da, 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 da. we had, I don't know, eight or 10 different ones that we were manufacturing at UC Riverside. Unless you created the conditions for that microbe, it wouldn't persist. And once you created the right conditions, boom, it would happen. And I did a bunch of microbial plantings in lemons with different materials. And we didn't see any um, growth improvement with or without any of the microbials. So, you know, micro there is so much out there and you think that you can come in and here and add a little bag of stuff and change it. The biome is, it fights it, it wants what is there. So I, I'm not, I'm saying don't put any supplemental microbials, create the right conditions and they will be there. Okay, and then there was one uh, follow-up question about the phosphite. So how about fertigation with phosphite? It works, it works very well. Okay, so I, I think at this time, since it's uh, just one minute to four, we want to make sure we honor the time. But I think um, I think we're planning on having another avocado disease uh, webinar, maybe sometime in January. Um, so you, I, if you have other diseases that you want to discuss, we can probably set that up for January. Um, for now, I wanted to just mention a few things before we put our final um, link up there. We are going to have a, a final, another webinar next month, December 12th. That one's going to be with UC IPM Pesticide Safety Education Coordinator Lisa Blecker, and she's going to be speaking on respirators. And um, that registration is now open. Also, I wanted to mention um, to any more information you would like to know about avocados, we do have on the UC IPM website, the pest management guidelines for avocado. So you can find out more information there. And at this time, I think we're gonna close out of the webinar. And uh, thank you all for attending and um, hopefully you'll attend one of our future ones. And thank you, Ben, for uh, presenting.